The committee is in session. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Deutsch for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Attorney General Barr, uh, you just told us that nothing was ever elevated to me. You had said in an interview recently that there's a process in place, an escalation system. It's the AG's responsibility to resolve it. How is this elevated to you, the case of Roger Stone? Uh, on Monday, February 10th, the U.S. Attorney uh, was with me, and he raised the issue with me. So it was he elevated was, by Timothy Shea? Yes. And um, had it been elevated uh, during the two months between the time the conviction came in under the former U.S. Attorney and, uh, and the time that Timothy Shea started? I, I think Shea may have had conversations with people in the now, Did you ever have conversations with a former U.S. attorney about this case, about the sentencing? Stone. I, I, I don't recall any discussion about Stone. With, right. With so, Stone. Timothy Shea, you said in the interview that he was new, he had just started. Um, he's, he was new, but he worked for you for a long time, didn't he? Yes. And what was his job for you? Well, when I was attorney general 30 years ago, he worked. No, 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 now, just, just now. He, he, was, he was on my staff. He advised you on, on criminal justice policy and law enforcement, right? Correct. And you, act, you named him acting U.S. attorney. Uh, had you discussed the Stone case with him before you named him acting U.S. attorney? No. Did you discuss sentencing with him? Not before. The first time was when he came in. It wasn't Monday, actually. To, just to refresh your recollection, in a prior interview, you said he came in the week before. He came in to see some senior staff. That's what I, no, that's what I said. He may have, he may have had discussions right. with people in the deputy's office. I was not involved in those discussions. Basically, I didn't, uh, as far as I can recall, I had no substantive involvement in Stone until that Monday when he came in in the morning. Well, the, I'm sorry, Mr. Attorney General, the week before when he came in to see the, the senior staff that I, he had worked with the week before when he was working on No, I, staff. I said I think he had raised it with people in the deputy's office. That's senior staff, too. Right. I understand. So, he, but I was not involved. He in started that. on he started on July 31st. The first week he was there, he came to raise this issue. I think he started February 1st. Right. Yeah. The first week he was there, he came into your office to raise the issue of sentencing. Um, in the interview you did with ABC, you said no, you No, I, I don't think he... he that's what, you, that's what you told ABC News. You said that he's talked to senior staff. Not you, perhaps, but he talked to senior staff. That, I, I, I don't, I don't know what, you, you know, I, I think I speak English. I said that before he came in to see me, I believe he had some conversations. Conversations with, with senior staff, right. That's right, before he okay. came to see you. We're saying the same thing. But, I but, just the, asked, but the first it was raised with me. Was on Monday. Was on Monday. Did you talk to the senior staff after they spoke with him? I think at a 9 o'clock meeting, uh, they said that uh, he was trying to work something out on sentencing, and, and he was actually optimistic that something could be worked out. So I didn't really think of it as an issue until that Monday, when he told me that right. the so prosecutors. He, so then he filed. So then they filed. He filed the sentencing uh, memo, and the sentencing memo called for seven to nine years. It's the policy of the U.S. Attorney's Office to suggest a specific guideline range, which, um, which they did. And then you overruled the line prosecutors. They asked for a lower sentence. Um, and you gave some reasons. You talked about health. Health is to be considered only for an extraordinary physical impairment. Did that apply to Roger Stone, Mr. Uh, Attorney General? Actually, That's what the guidelines said. That's well, actually, I, I, can't, you know, I can't reveal all the information. I just, you, I'm not asking what his health was, but did that apply? No. Okay. Uh, I'm and did, did what, and I'm sorry, did it, what apply? His health. The, was that the, the reason? Health, health is a reason to. Take I know. Is that the account. case? Is that the reason for Roger Stone? That for you're asking for a lower sentence. Let me go on. It says I age. Why. Let me go on. Let me I go on. Age, why I hold on one second. Age can be consideration. It says only if it creates conditions that are of an unusual degree and distinguish the case from typical cases. He was 67. Did the that judge agreed that? with me, Congressman. No, that's not the what judge I'm, I'm not me. asking you that. The Mr. judge Attorney. agreed I'm with me. I'm not asking whether. I know you're not. I'm asking, not asking and you I'm that. Saying. And the issue here is the issue here is whether Roger Stone was treated differently because he was friends with the president. When you asked that, when you asked to reduce the sentence, you said enhancements were technically applicable. Mr. Attorney General, can you think of any other cases? where the defendant threatened to kill a witness, threatened to threaten a judge, lied to a judge, where the Department of Justice claimed that those were mere technicalities. Can you think of even one? The judge agreed with our analysis. Can you think of even one? I'm not asking about the judge. I'm asking about what you did to reduce the sentence of, of Roger Stone. Uh, yes. Can you think, Mr. Are... Attorney General, 
He threatened the life of a witness. And the witness and said you he view didn't that feel as threatened. a technicality, Mr. Attorney General. The, 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 has, the witness, is there another time Can I answer the question? Happened? Can I have just a few seconds to sure, answer the question? Sure. I'm asking if okay. there's another time in, in this all case, the time of the Justice the Department. Judge, the judge agreed with our— You won't answer my question, the Mr. Judge Attorney agreed General, and it's unfortunate. And it, the appearance is that, as you said earlier, this is exactly what you want. The essence of rule of law is that we have one rule for everybody, and we right. don't in this case because he's a friend of the President's. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Uh, Ms. Roby. Mr. Attorney General, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I'm a member of both this committee as well as the Appropriations Committee, and I've been able to see firsthand um, both the funding and the operation of the department. Um, additionally, before I was elected to Congress, I served on the city council in my hometown of Montgomery, Alabama. And I've witnessed the importance and the value of various Justice Department grant programs and the resources to state and local governments. For example, the Alabama Fusion Center, uh, which is designed to combine information between federal, state, and local government, private sector entities, and the intelligence community um, has been a recipient of these federal grants. And the Alabama Fusion Center is also responsible for the Alabama Center for Missing and Exploited uh, Children and has done a great job um, in work in combating um, child exploitation. Do you believe that Congress is adequately funding programs that provide state and local agencies with the tools that they need uh, to be effective in preventing and pursuing crimes such as child exploitation and human trafficking, um, particularly over the internet? I think we could always use more res resources for that, Congressman. But, but if I could just have a moment of your time to respond to these questions sure. here on, uh, that were being asked about this, the uh, Roger Stone sentencing. The, uh, U.S. attorney came to me and said that the four aligned prosecutors were threatening to resign unless they could recommend seven to nine years. Uh, but there was no comparable case to support that. It would have been a very disparate sentence. All the cases were clustered around three-year sentence for that. And the way they had gotten to the seven to nine was by applying an enhancement. And there, and there are debates all the time within the Department of Justice about the proper calculations under the guidelines and whether a particular enhancement applies or doesn't apply. And those are usually uh, worked out and resolved. But here they were saying that they were taking an enhancement that has traditionally been applied to mafioso and things like that, threatening a witness, and they were applying it to him because he had a phone call at night where he told a witness that if you want to get it on, let's get it on, and, and I'll take your dog. And uh, we felt that that technically could apply, but in this case, it really didn't reflect the underlying conduct and the overarching requirement at the Department of Justice is that we do not presume and automatically apply the guidelines. We make individual assessments of the defendant and what is really just under the case and nothing that is excessive. And uh, these individuals were trying to force the U.S. attorney uh, who was new in the office to adopt seven to nine. And I made the decision, no, uh, we are going to uh, leave it up to the judge and that later, when that was not done, that evening, I told people we had to go back and correct that the next morning. So that, that's the sequence of events. But at the end of the day, the proof of the pudding is in the, uh, in the eating. The judge said she would not have gone along, she didn't think, with the first recommendation because the enhancement artificially inflated the exposure of the defendant. And she came out exactly where I had come out. So at the end of the day, the question is fairness to the individual. And uh, even though I was going to uh, get a lot of criticism I, at the end of the, uh, for, for doing that, uh, I think at the end of the day, my obligation is to be fair to the individual. Thank you for permitting me. Yeah, I'm happy to, to have yielded you uh, time to respond. Uh, that being said, um, Mr. Attorney General, um, as I am a departing member of Congress and have just a few short moments left, I just want to express to you 
uh, in the department how important this issue that I originally asked you about is to me, both as a member of Congress representing my constituents in Alabama, but also as a mother of two beautiful children. And I am increasingly alarmed um, about the way that children are just one click away from um, being on a website, a forum, or a chat room, or a social media site where bad actors uh, may be lurking. And whereas I only have a few short seconds left, I would just ask you in the time that I have left in Congress that we could continue to work together um, to combat um, child exploitation and uh, human trafficking. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing on this. Absolutely, Congresswoman. And, and as you know, one of the most difficult issues coming up is uh, encryption because as this material gets encrypted in the chat rooms and the areas where they groom these young children, uh, once it becomes encrypted, it'll be very hard for us to uh, police it. Right, thank you so much. I yield back, thank you. The gentlelady yields back, Ms. Bass. Uh, Attorney General Barr, when it comes to police engagement, last August when speaking to the National Fraternal Order of Police, you shared your views on police engagement with the public. You stated, and I quote, underscore the need to comply first, and if warranted, complain later. This will make everyone safe, the police, subject, the police sub suspects and the community at large, and those who resist must be prosecuted. I repeat, zero tolerance for resisting police. This will save lives. Do you stand by that statement? Yes, I think it's very important. A, a that zero tolerance attitude is costing lives, not saving them, especially in communities of Well, I'm not, I'm not saying uh, that. I reclaim my time. A movement and protests have arisen in response to police brutality. Here are a few examples of who bears the cost of zero tolerance. Elijah McLean was walking home from a convenience store when he was approached by police. He had not committed a crime. Police held him in a chokehold for 15 minutes, then injected him with catamine. Ketamine, not under a doctor's supervision, but at the direction of non-medically trained and unlicensed police officers. Are you familiar with that case? No. Do you know how frequently ketamine is used by law enforcement to subdue civilians, especially people of color? No. Did you know if police departments have been documented as directing paramedics and EMTs to eject ketamine during arrests? No. Um, have you, well then, I guess you haven't evaluated the use of force tactics by beca since becoming AG and, and especially this particular tactic of subdu subduing suspects with ketamine? Not with respect to ketamine, no. Will you commit to directing the department to evaluate the protocols around the use of ketamine, chokeholds, and other methods used by federal law enforcement officials when making arrests or detaining subjects? Well, absolutely, under the president's executive order, we are reviewing uh, Thank you. And especially, use of force and working good. with police departments. As, especially the ketamine. That's pretty outrageous. Ketamine. George Floyd was killed by a police officer via a chokehold. For eight minutes and 46 seconds, a police officer knelt on his neck as he, as he begged for his life. He was suspected of using a counterfeit $20 bill. That's how zero tolerance can amount to a death sentence for black men when used in communities of color. With George Floyd screaming, as we all know, he couldn't breathe. Now consider James Holmes, who murdered 12 people and injured 70 others in a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, the same town as Elijah McLean, where he was arrested. James wore body armor, had a knife, semi-automatic weapons, and an AR-15. Yet he was calmly arrested by the same police department as Elijah McLean without a chokehold or an injection of ketamine. Dylan Roof used a gun to murder nine people and injured another at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in South Carolina. When he was arrested, no chokeholds, no injections, he was treated so well that officers brought Dylan Roof Burger King after arresting him. Are you familiar with that case? Yes. I raised those two examples to follow up on what my colleague from Texas highlighted earlier, that the department is not doing enough to address issues of racism, bias, and brutality in law enforcement. When someone who commits mass murder is calmly arrested and served Burger King, while a young man walking down the street is placed in a chokehold and injected with ketamine, then dies. Uh, you said that uh, under the executive order, the administration is looking at chokeholds. What have you uh, determined so far? 
Well, we're, we're uh, setting up a system uh, of certification of police departments, and part of what our charter is is to come up with um, criteria that will be used for certification, including limitations on use of force, specifically including cho chokeholds. So in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, part of it called for a national registry of law enforcement officers as a resource for police chiefs to determine who are the best candidates for jobs. Uh, as you may or may not be aware, Tamir Rice might be alive today if, police, if the police chief who hired him had known that that police officer had been fired uh, from another department. What is your view of a national registry of law enforcement officers? Uh, the, the second aspect of the president's executive order is to set up a database like that so that all uh, determinations of excessive force around the country go into that database. And if police departments aren't reporting that information, they wouldn't be certified. So we do believe in one national point where you can go in and get uh, determinations of excessive force on uh, law enforcement candidates for jobs. Good, thank you. And, and I do want to uh, comment on part of your opening statement when you were saying that after the Jim Crow period that our justice system was equal. And um, I don't believe that, that that's I said the, the law. Case. I said the laws were made equal. The laws are made equal. They are certainly not applied equally. Uh, we do have systemic problems in our law enforcement system, our criminal justice system on every level. The fact of the matter is 2.3 million people in the United States are incarcerated. We incarcerate 24% of the world's prisoners. 34% are black, while African Americans are just 13% of the, of the U.S. population. So justice is still not equal, nor are our laws. And I think when we look at how many people are incarcerated or how many people are killed, it is not the numbers. It is the percentage to the percentage of that group in the U.S. population. I yield back the time. The gentlelady, the gentlelady yields back. Uh, Mr. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Attorney General, you've described the prosecution of Roger Stone as righteous. That's clearly something that the President and I disagree with you on. Uh, I would suggest that perhaps the prosecution of Andrew McCabe, who lied four times, thrice under the penalty of perjury, would be more righteous. I would suggest to you that uncovering the criminal conspiracy that existed where people in our own government were trying to convince intelligence agents and operatives around the world to destabilize our elections and to discredit our president would perhaps be more righteous. But as we sit here today, I don't think that Mr. Stone or Mr. McCabe or any of those other folks are killing anyone or burning down our buildings. And so I'd like to focus our effort on the most acute need I believe our country has. You've recently said that you believe Antifa to be a terrorist organization. What's your basis for that belief? I, I, I'm not sure I said terrorist organization. I said we're investigating it as domestic terrorism. But uh, Antifa, there are a number of uh, violent extreme groups in the United States, and they're across the spectrum. Uh, Antifa is heavily represented in the recent riots. That's not to say they're the only group involved. Uh, and uh, they have been identified as involved in a number of the, of the violent m mob actions that have taken place around the country. And Mr. Attorney General, I, I saw the chairman of the Judiciary Committee recently say that Antifa is a myth, that their involvement in this violence uh, isn't something that, that is real. What's your reaction to the chairman? Well, I don't think it's a myth. Uh, Antifa is, 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 uh, uh, can be best thought of, I think, as an as a, uh, umbrella term for what is essentially a movement comprised of uh, loosely organized groups around the country. In some, of these, in some areas of the country, there are a number of groups and there are sort of centers of activity. Uh, the groups, uh, as I say, are loosely organized, but they are definitely organized. Uh, but as, uh, since they have an, an anarchic temperament, they don't get along very well with each other. So I'm not suggesting it's a national organization that, that, that moves nationally. Uh, they tend to, to get organized for an event. And uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, 
organization right before an event occurs, but we see a lot of the organization during the, the mob violence. And, and that is a really important distinction when determining how to apply particularly our RICO laws to an organization like this. If Antifa is merely something that inspires people to go out and commit violence, that strikes me as legally distinct from Antifa being uh, an organizing influence to assist people in committing crimes. One question I get from my constituents is they watch the death and violence and disruption and chaos in Seattle and in Portland and in other places is whether or not there's a risk that that could metastasize to other areas of the country. Have you given consideration to the risk that might befall other American communities if the Department of Justice were not to take action to protect and preserve federal property in places like Portland? Yes, absolutely. You know, we are concerned about this problem metastasizing around the country. And, and so uh, we feel that we have to, uh, in a place like Portland, where even where we don't have the support of the, uh, the state, gov the local government, uh, we have to take a stand and defend this federal property. We can't uh, get to a level where we're, we're going to accept these kinds of violent attacks on federal courts. And if you did what my Democrat colleagues were asking, if you merely abandoned that federal property, allowed it to be overrun, allowed the people inside to be harmed. Is it your view then that Antifa and other violent people engaged in these acts would simply stop, would simply accept that as their sole victory? Or is it your expert opinion, having dealt with a number of law enforcement and criminal cases in your legal career, that, that they wouldn't stop, that they would go to the next town, to the next community, and potentially inspire more violence? There's no doubt in my mind that it would spread. And, and what comfort can you give Americans in my district and around the country that, that you will stop this, that you will stop the burning and destruction of federal property, and that you, will, that you will give confidence to regular Americans that they can go out in the streets without the risk of this terrorism? Well, as you can see in, in Portland, we have uh, a relatively small number of, of federal officers who have been withstanding this for almost two months. Uh, it's a great strain, but we, we cannot just stand aside and allow the federal court to be destroyed. Thank you for your service and for your great work. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Attorney General Barr, you started your testimony with eloquent words about the life and legacy of John Lewis fighting systematic racism, uh, voter intimidation, civil rights. Uh, the one thing that you have in common with your two predecessors, both Attorney General Sessions, and Attorney General Whitaker, is that when you all came here and brought your top staff, you brought no black people. That, sir, is systematic racism. That is exactly what John Lewis spent his life uh, fighting. And so I would just suggest uh, that actions speak louder than words, and you should really should keep the name of the Honorable John Lewis out of the Department of Justice's uh, mouth. Uh, let me also say, you mentioned bogus Russiagate. In your opinion, as the Attorney General of the United States of America, did Russia interfere or attempt to interfere in the 2016 election? Uh, yes. In your position as the Attorney General of the United States, is Russia attempting to interfere in the 2020 presidential election? Uh, I, think, I think we have to assume that they are. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, Let's talk about the integrity of the election, which is also uh, something Congressman Lewis uh, fought for. Jared Kushner implied that the president could move the election day. Can a sitting U.S. president move an election day? Actually, I haven't looked into that question under the Constitution. Well, 2 U.S. Code Section 7 says federal election day is the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. So if you take that as the correct statute, uh, is there any executive action by a president? I've never been me? asked the question before. I've never looked into it. As Attorney General of the United States, do you believe that this 2020 presidential election will be rigged? I have no reason to think it will be. Uh, president Trump tweeted uh, that the election will be rigged, but he also tweeted that when he was losing to Hillary Clinton, and he tweeted that a day after it was Fox showed that he was losing to Trump. But I don't want to be too political. Do you believe, as the Attorney General of the United States, that mail-in voting will lead to massive voter fraud? 
I think there's a high risk that it will. Do you ever vote by mail-in ballot? Apparently I did once at least. But you believe that other people voting by mail could lead to massive fraud? No, what I've talked about, made very clear, is that I'm not talking about accommodations to people who have to be out of the state or have some particular need not to, uh, uh, inability to go and vote. What I'm talking about is the wholesale conversion of election to mail-in voting. You, you do understand that African Americans disproportionately do not survive COVID-19 coronavirus. You are aware of that. I didn't hear the question. You are aware that African Americans, black people, disproportionately die from COVID-19 coronavirus, correct? I th yes, I think that's right. And not that it would be uh, the first time that African Americans would risk their lives to vote in this country to preserve its democracy. Uh, but the suggestion is that them having the ability to vote by mail would somehow uh, lead to massive voter fraud, but I won't stick to that. No, I, I didn't say that. I just uh, state, I think, what is a reality, which is that if you have wholesale mail-in voting, it substantially increases the risk of fraud. That's but it doesn't said. make it likely. That's all I said. Now, I also saw on TV that the president said he's not sure that he'll accept the election results. Can a president just protest because he lost an election? Protest in what sense? Well, can he contest an election just because he simply loses? Well, Gore versus B B you know, Bush v. Gore was... Well, I think that that was over uh, a slim voter margin. I'm talking about if it is very clear that the president has lost an election, uh, does he have a remedy to contest the election? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, let me go back to what uh, Representative Bass mentioned. You mentioned the number that there were eight African-American killed by the police and 11 uh, white people killed by the police. So if you, far if, this year? If you use those numbers, uh, that's 85% of that population is white, 15% of that population is black. But if you actually look at the deaths according to the numbers you just gave, 42% of the deaths are African American mm -hmm. and 58% are white. That is a glaring disparity in terms of population. And I just give you those numbers. Well, not, not necessarily. Because, because I have to adjust it by, who, by the, you know, the race of the criminal perpetrator. No, I, I just did that for you. I'm using your numbers. And according to your numbers, African Americans are four or five times more likely uh, than their percentage of the population to be killed by police than their no, white well, counterparts. The, the actual, so the, I, I just wanted to give you that based on your numbers? Actually, the studies I've seen have suggested two things. One, that in fact, uh, police are less likely uh, to shoot at a black suspect, a little bit more likely to shoot at white. However, that, black, that police are, are more inclined to use non-lethal force in a uh, contact with an African American suspect. So those are the those in, in terms of the statistics. That's what it looks like to me. Any data that you have that shows that <clears throat> African Americans are less likely to die at the hands of police or be shot or shot at, uh, to me, is a a incorrect uh, analysis. But I am interested in seeing it. So if you have it, please see it. I won't call it any names. But if that data exists, I would be more than happy to see it. And since you're sending me that data, can you send me the data of African Americans within the Department of Justice? How many you have in leadership sure. ranks all the way down? Thank sure. you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I would remind Mr. Jordan, Mr. Biggs, and Mr. Johnson to stop violating the rules of the committee, to stop violating the safety of the members of the committee, to stop um, holding themselves out as not caring, by refusing to wear their masks. Can we get the picture is, is it permissible it, to drink it is, a sip of coffee? It is not permissible. Not, not to drink. We can't drink coffee in the room. I'm getting ready to ask questions room. now. I'm getting ready to ask questions Mr. Um, and I will. <laughs> Mr. Gates is recognized. No, no, no. He's no it, went. He, he went, and that's why I took off my okay, mask, my, Mr. My, Chairman. It's my turn. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Okay. Mr. Jordan is recognized. Mr. Attorney General, let's clear up a few things. Judge Berman Jackson agreed with your, uh, with your Stone sentencing recommendation. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, she said, I am concerned seven to nine years would be greater than necessary. I agree with the defense and with the government's second memorandum. So it couldn't be more clear they agreed with you. 
That's right. Lafayette Square. Would St. John's Church be standing today if you had not taken action? Well, I think uh, that was on Sunday. That was on Sunday night, and I think law enforcement did use tear gas. And my understanding is that night to clear the way so that the fire trucks could get in to, to uh, save St. John's Church. D Church. That was on Sunday night, though. Understand. Understand the time frame. But it would. Would, you, would it be standing today if there had not been action taken by uh, federal law enforcement and local law enforcement? Right. 38 people unmasked Michael Flynn's name 49 times in a two-month time frame. Seven people at the Treasury Department unmasked Michael Flynn's name. Is this an issue that Mr. Durham is looking into? <clears throat> I've asked another U.S. attorney to look into the issue of unmasking because of, you know, the high number of unmaskings and some that do not readily appear to have been um, in the line of normal business. Wait a minute. So I want to be clear. So there is a there is another investigation on that issue specifically going on at the Justice Department right now. Yes. Wow, that's great. I, I, so Mr. Durham is looking at how the whole Trump Russia thing started. You have another U.S. attorney. Can you give us that U.S. attorney's name, or is that something you're comfortable doing? Or? John Bash of Texas. John Bash of Texas is looking specifically at the fact at unmasking. 38 people, 49 times, unmasked Michael Flynn's name and probably other unmaskings that took place in the final days of the Obama-Biden administration. Is that accurate? Actually, a much longer period of time. Even before that? Yes. Thank you, Mr. I, I appreciate that. And that's information that the committee did not, uh, did not know. Are peaceful protests violent, Mr. Attorney General? No. Do peaceful protests destroy businesses? No. Do peaceful protests injure officers? No. Do peaceful protests attack civilians? No. Do peaceful protests burn down buildings? No. I was, you know, the, the video we played, it's hard to watch. It's really hard to watch to see that happening in our great country. But there was one, the, the start of it was almost laughable where you have the reporter saying, as a building is burning behind him, it's not generally speaking an unruly protest. It's mostly just a protest. I mean, it's almost laughable when you have the reporter saying, I guess, I guess he's saying it's not a fire, it's just a burning building. I guess he's saying it's a peaceful burning building. Um, a few weeks ago, well, let me ask you this. I'm, I, I want to go right to this. Is defunding the police a rational policy? No, I, I think, if anything, uh, I'm more concerned that the, the police be adequately funded today and, and get more resources. A lot of the things we need to do to address uh, some of the concerns people have about what they saw in Minneapolis are going to take some resources, some of the training uh, that we have to do. And uh, one of the difficulties in our country, it's not a difficulty, it's a fact, we have 18,000 law enforcement agencies. Some, most of them are very, very small. And so we have to find a way of, of training, uh, you know, making sure the training is pushed out. Is it dangerous? Dangerous to defund the police? It's extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. And some of the ordinances you're seeing cities pass are also dangerous. Are you familiar with the letter that Chief of Police of Seattle, Carmen Best, sent to business owners and residents in that city? Yes, I am saying that you know she cannot protect, uh, she can't do her job. Her police force cannot do the job because That's exactly of the what she said. Yeah. Gives officers the po policy they're trying to pass. Thank goodness the court stopped it. The policy they're trying to pass gives officers no ability, and she emphasized no, not us, not, not you, Mr. Train, not me, gives officers no ability to safely intercede to preserve property in the midst of large, violent crowds. Mm -hmm. She also said in that letter, and again, she's, she's taken the leadership and responsibility to tell the business owners, this, the citizens, that she's supposed to serve. She also tells him in that letter, I've done my due diligence on informing the council numerous times. So she's saying, I tried to tell them, these, these people won't listen to me. And then finally she says this, and this is the scary part. This is why it's so dangerous. She says this in her letter, Seattle police will have an adjusted deployment. That's a nice way of saying, you're on your own. We can't help you. That is how scary this defund the police. And here's the kicker, here's the kicker. These same cities sent you a letter last week, the same week uh, Chief of Police Best does this to the re residents and citizens of, of her city. Her mayor sends you a letter blaming you, blaming the federal government for the violence that is happening in these cities. That, that, that is how ridiculous the left's position has become. I appreciate the work you're doing, Mr. Attorney General. I'm, I'm over time. I yield back. Thank you. The, the gentleman yields, Mr. Jeffries. Uh, Mr. Barr, the job of the Attorney General 
is to defend the best interests of the people and serve as the people's lawyer. But during your time as Attorney General, you have consistently undermined democracy, undermined the Constitution, and undermined the health, safety, and well-being of the American people, all to personally benefit Donald Trump. Now, you just testified that there's no mechanism for a president to contest an election that has clearly been won by the opponent. Mr. Attorney General, what will you do if Donald Trump loses the election on November 3rd, but refuses to leave office on January 20th? If, well, if the results are clear, uh, I would leave office. Do you believe that there is any basis or legitimacy to Donald Trump's recent claim that he can't provide an answer as to whether he would leave office? I really am not familiar with these comments or the context in which they occurred, so I'm not going to give commentary on them. Okay, thank you. He just stated that publicly about a week ago to Fox uh, news. Mr. Barr, during a radio interview this spring with Hugh Hewitt, you praised President Trump's coronavirus response as superb, correct? Who did? You did. Okay. Over 150,000 Americans have died. More than 4 million Americans have been infected. More than 5 million Americans have lost their health care. Over 100,000 small businesses have permanently closed. More than 50 million Americans are out of work. This is not the outcome of superb leadership. What we've gotten from Donald Trump is exactly the opposite. Well, I, Let's explore. Well, I disagree with that. That, that. that was not a question. That was a statement. Let's explore. In February, President Trump falsely claimed that the number of coronavirus cases would go from 15 to zero in a few days. Was that superb? Yes or no? I, I'd have to see the context in which it was said. Here's the context. Well, the number well, of cases didn't go down to zero. It's over 4 million. Let's go to March. In that month, President Trump said, I take no responsibility at all for the failure in testing. Was that superb? Yes or no? It was accurate. The, 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 the problem with the testing system was a function of President Obama's mishandling of the CDC and his efforts to uh, <laughs> centralize everything in the CDC when yeah, they could, didn't thank have you, the Thank you, Mr. Barr. That is inaccurate. That's a myth. It wasn't until this That's administration. It wasn't claiming my time. In April, President Trump irresponsibly suggested that the American people inject themselves with bleach. Was that superb? That's, yes or no? That's not what I heard. That's exactly what he said. That's what the American people heard. And you know it, and you can't defend it. Let's move on to May. In that month, on National Nurses Day, President Trump falsely called PPE shortages fake news, while nurses and other healthcare professionals resorted to wearing trash bags and ski goggles to protect themselves. Fake news. Was that superb? Yes or no? I think the administration did a good job of, of mustering PPE and, and, and the national supply of PPE was run down during the Obama administration and never replaced. Thank you, Mr. Barr. The answer is no, it was not superb. By June, President Trump irresponsibly continued to refuse to wear a mask despite the public health guidance from his own experts. Was that superb? Yes or no? Which guidance? The earlier guidance that the masks wouldn't work? You know exactly the guidance that we're talking about. The CDC and Dr. Fauci in April recommended that the American people wear a mask, but Donald Trump has become the poster boy for the anti-mask okay, movement. Donald, Donald Trump has probably tested more than any other human being on the face of yeah, the earth. Mr. As Barr, the answer point. is the refusal to wear a mask is not superb. Last question. In July, President Trump falsely claimed that 99% of COVID-19 cases are, quote, totally harmless. Was that superb? Yes or no? I think essentially what he was saying is that the, the fatality rate relatively is very low, very low. The answer is 150,000 Americans are dead. It has been a failure of epic proportions. In fact, Donald Trump's 
response to the coronavirus pandemic has been the worst failure of any president in American history. And the American people have paid the price. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Well, I'm, I guess I do. If it's, I think it's my turn to speak and ask questions. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? Yep. Then I seek recognition, sir. Gentleman is recognized. Oh, bless your heart. Thank you. Um, Attorney General Barr, Chairman Nadler opened up his statement by saying you can no longer hide behind a legal fiction. That, that caused me some consternation. I had no idea what he was talking about. Do you have any idea what he's talking about? I don't recall that phrase in, in, in what context. Well, who, who knows what context? I mean, he was just kind of rattling on there, but uh, he was, he was uh, uh, attacking you and your performance and virtually everything he could and said, you can no longer hide behind a legal fiction. Um, and I didn't see any connection with anything else he th had been saying, so I wondered if you had seen anything, and apparently you didn't see anything either. Um, the next person to ask questions was the gentlelady from California who consistently referred to um, civilian federal agents as federal troops and intimating, if you will, that uh, Portland was peaceable until federal civilian agents arrived on the scene. Essentially, it's kind of analogous to blaming a fire department for showing up to put out a fire and then being blamed for starting the fire. Attorney General Barr, let's just have it on the record. Was there violence and attempts to burn down, vandalize the building and attack um, civilian employees of the federal government prior to any other federal agents or the reinforcements being sent in of federal agents? Yeah, my recollection is our, our main effort to reinforce was around the 4th of July period and it had been going on for quite a while before that. Let's talk about Lafayette Square for a second. Um, the, uh, leading up to June 1st, you had violent mobs disobeying the 11 p.m. curfew. They set fire to parked cars, demolished coffee shops and banks, burned American flags, and even intentionally set fire to St. John's Episcopal Church near Lafayette Square. Secret Service and, and uh, Park Police appropriate use of safe restorative force um, actually cleared that up. In total, however, 51 U.S. Park Police officers were injured during the weekend leading up to the perimeter expansion. Can you, do you want to expand on, right. on the actions regarding Lafayette Park? Right, so for the 29th, 30th, and 31st, there was unprecedented uh, rioting right around uh, the White House, uh, very violent. During that time, as you say, about 50 park police and a comparable number is my recollection of Secret Service. Uh, so we had about, nine, I think, around 90 uh, officers injured. I'm talking about things like concussions, uh, one was operated on, and so forth. Uh, we had the president, it was so bad that, as it's been reported, uh, the Secret Service recommended the president go down to the shelter. We had a breach of the Treasury Department. Uh, the, the historical building on, on Lafayette Park was burned down, the lodge. Uh, St. Uh, John's was, uh, was set on fire. Bricks were thrown at the police repeatedly. They took crowbars and pried up the pavers at, on Lafayette Park and threw those at the police. Balloons of caustic liquid were thrown on the police. And uh, it was clear when I arrived at the White House on Monday uh, there was total consensus that the, we couldn't allow that to happen uh, so close to the White House, uh, that kind of rioting, and therefore we had to move the perimeter out uh, one block and push it up toward I Street, and there was already a plan in being at that point that the Park Police and the Secret Service had worked out the night before, uh, which was to put the perimeter further away and then give them time to put a non-scalable fence across the northern part of uh, the park. During the day, during Monday, the, uh, the, f the factors that led to the timing of it were uh, that that movement was going to be made as soon as there were enough uh, units in place to actually perform it, and units were very slow in getting into place throughout the day, much to my frustration because I wanted it moved uh, before there was a big buildup of demonstrators. Uh, and also the fencing had to be delivered. And when those things were accomplished, the tactical uh, commander in charge of the park police uh, proceeded with the, with the movement of pushing the uh, 
the perimeter. So this was, this was something conceived of long before and didn't turn on the, the nature of the crowd, although I would say the crowd was very unruly. And, and while the tactical considerations were made by the park police, uh, you know, they, they tried to respond to the situation. To say that this had to do uh, with a photo op is, you know, and I don't mean to analogize this to a military operation, but it's akin to saying that we invaded the Philippines in World War II so Douglas MacArthur could walk through the surf on the beach. One follows the other, but we did not invade the Philippines so that Douglas MacArthur could walk to the beach. Thank you. You'll... Gentleman yields back, uh, Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Barr, have you ever intervened other than to help the President's friend get a reduced prison sentence for any other case where a prosecutor had filed a sentencing recommendation with the court? A sentencing recommendation? Yeah. Have you ever intervened other than that case for the President's friend? Not that I recall. If you're Is, talking, does that seem like something you'd recall where you would? Well, I'm, I'm saying I can't really remember my first. If you let me finish the question, I, I, I can't remember. Big, Thirty years ago, I was attorney general. As attorney general now. Uh, but uh, no, I didn't. But that's because issues come up to the attorney general in a dispute, and I have never heard so of a dispute. I've never heard of a dispute in the department Mr. where Barr. line prosecutors threatened to quit. Well, it's a pretty uh, because, big deal, because, and they, they with because of a because so of a Barr, discussion over sentencing. Americans from both this. parties are concerned that in Donald Trump's America, there's two systems of justice: one for Mr. Trump and his cronies, and another for the rest of us. But that can only happen if you enable it. At your confirmation hearing, you were asked, do you believe a president could lawfully issue a pardon in exchange for the recipient's promise to not incriminate him? You said, no. Not, not to what? That would be a crime. You were asked, could a president issue a pardon in exchange for the recipient's promise to not incriminate him? And you responded, no, that would be a crime. Is that right? Yes, I said that. You said a crime. You didn't say it'd be wrong. You didn't say it'd be unlawful. You said it would be a crime. And when you said that, that a president swapping a pardon to silence a witness would be a crime, you were promising the American people that if you saw that, you would do something about it. Is that right? That's right. Now, Mr. Barr, are you investigating Donald Trump for commuting the prison sentence of his longtime friend and political advisor, Roger Stone? No. Why not? Why should I? Well, let's talk <laughs> about that. Mr. Stone was convicted by a jury on seven counts of lying in the Russia investigation. He bragged that he lied to save Trump's butt. But why would he lie? Your prosecutors, Mr. Barr, told a jury that Stone lied because the truth looked bad for Donald Trump. And what truth is that? Well, Donald Trump denied in written answers to the Russia investigators that he talked to Roger Stone during the time Roger Stone was in contact with agents of a Russian influence operation. There's evidence that Trump and Stone indeed did, did talk during that time. You would agree that it's a federal crime to lie under oath, is that right? Yes. It's a crime for you, it's a crime for me, and it's certainly a crime for the President of the United States. Is that right? Yes. So if Donald Trump lied to the Mueller investigators, which you agree would be a crime, then Roger Stone was in a position to expose Donald Trump's lies. Are you familiar with the December 3rd, 2018 tweet where Donald Trump said Roger Stone had shown guts by not testifying against him? No, I'm not familiar with that. You don't read the President's tweets? No. Well, there's a lot of evidence in the president's treats, Mr. Attorney General. I think you should start reading them because he said Mr. Stone showed guts. But on July 10 of this year, Roger Stone declared to a reporter, I had 29 or 30 conversations with Trump during the campaign period. Trump knows I was under enormous pressure to turn on him. It would have eased my situation considerably, but I didn't. The prosecutors wanted me to play Judas. I refused. Are you familiar with that Stone statement? Actually, I'm not. So how can you sit here and tell us why should I investigate the President of the United States if you're not even aware of the facts concerning the President <laughs> using the pardon or commutation power to swap the silence of a witness? Because we, we require uh, you know, a reliable predicate before we open a criminal investigation. And I just gave to you, sir. Well, I, I don't consider it. I consider it a very Rube uh, Goldberg theory that you have. Well, it, it sounds like you're hearing this and, and by the, the way, if I apply, if if I apply this standard, standard there'd, General, be a lot, there'd be a lot more people under investigation. Mr. Attorney General, the very same day that Roger Stone said that, Donald Trump, that's one of the, no the, surprise, the, the true two standards sentence. of justice were really so, during the tail end of the Obama Mr. administration. Mr. Attorney General, let's turn to the Michael Cohen case. Are you aware, sir, that Michael Cohen, after being released from prison, was asked to not engage with the media, including to write a book 
Were you aware that that was going to be asked of him? Was I aware? Yes. No. Do you know if anyone else in your department was aware? Uh, maybe I should tell you what happened. Why don't you tell us what happened? Okay. He was furloughed from the Bureau of Prisons. No, no. Why don't you tell us why he was asked? I will tell you. Agreement not because to something that people don't seem to understand is that his home confinement was not being supervised by the Bureau of Prisons. It, now, was, being, Bureau of Prisons. it was being supervised by the probation office, which is part of the U.S. court system. And Are it was the U.S. court system that had the requirements about and not yes, writing. Yes, that U.S. court system called your actions retaliatory. Do you I'm, agree with that? No, so all I know is what, I, what has been said in court before the judge and in the record, Mr. which Parker. is that the individual uh, was then called by the U.S. court system saying that this guy, Cohen, is uncooperative, he's not agreeing to the conditions. And at that point, a Bureau of Prisons person made the decision that he was no longer eligible for home confinement. Conditions that a federal judge said no other inmate had ever been asked of in his experience. Mr. Barr, you told ABC News that the president's tweets sometimes make your job impossible. But sir, your job is only impossible if you enable the president's corrupt schemes. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, the Constitution says the president shall have the power uh, to grant uh, uh, reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States except in cases of impeachment. Do you note any other limitations in the Constitution on the president's power to pardon? No. Has the president exceeded that power? No. Uh, my uh, colleague from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, implied that uh, in challenging the sentencing recommendation of Roger Stone, you were doing the bidding of the president. He, he didn't want to hear your response. I, I would. Well, no, I was, uh, uh, Roger Stone, I never discussed our sentencing recommendation with anyone outside the Department of Justice. And it was a very condensed period of time. I first heard, I, I made the decision that we shouldn't take a position as to the, the precise uh, uh, sentence, but should leave it up to the judge. And we should not affirmatively advocate for seven to nine years. And I made that uh, on Monday the 10th. And that, that night we filed, the department filed, and it didn't reflect what I had decided. So that night I told people we had to fix it first thing in the morning. Uh, so uh, we did. As soon as I got in, we, 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 went for, we went forward with a plan to file. At that point I learned about the president's tweet because I don't monitor the president's tweets. Uh, and I hesitated because I knew that I would be attacked for doing it. Uh, and people would make the, you know, argue that I did it because of the tweet. But I felt at the end of the day, I really had to go forward uh, with our filing because it was the right thing to do. And I'm glad the judge agreed with it. Uh, we're learning more and more about the targeting and prosecution and, and extortion of Michael Flynn by partisan officials at the FBI. No one has been held accountable for this grotesque abuse of power. Um, knowing that agents with a political agenda can take anything that someone says, edit it, misrepresent it, prosecute it, and then extort confessions by threatening family members, and to do so with impunity, why would anyone in his right mind ever want to talk to an FBI agent again? Well, I, I don't, you know, I haven't reached judgments, and I'm not suggesting that all those facts you set forth are, are true, and, I, and we have not uh, at this point. Uh, uh, challenge the actions of the, I've defended the actions of the prosecutors in this case in court. Uh, my, my, the order of business right now uh, is knowing what we know now, uh, we don't think any uh, of the U.S. attorneys in the department would have prosecuted this case, uh, partly because of the behavior of the FBI, but also because the evidence is not there to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And part of what I'm trying to uh, establish is that we will use the same standards for everybody before we indict anybody. And this goes for every, both sides. Uh, we won't prosecute anyone, anybody unless there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt that they committed a crime. And not some kind of esoteric made-up crime, but a meat and potatoes crime. Um, for more than three years, the most powerful agencies in our government took information that was fabricated by agents of a political campaign that they knew was fraudulent, used it as justification to launch an investigation alleging treason against a presidential candidate, then leaked the existence of that investigation in a manner that was clearly calculated to affect the outcome of the election, 
and then failing that, used it in a largely successful attempt to obstruct the duly elected president. Are you going to be able to, to right this wrong before it becomes a precedent for future election interference by corrupt officials in our justice and intelligence agencies? You know, I, I really can't predict that. I think, uh, as you know, uh, John Durham is looking at all these matters. Uh, COVID did delay that action for a while, but he's working very diligently. And, you know, justice is not something you order up on a, a schedule like you're ordering a pizza. Well, know. there are many of us who are concerned that if you were succeeded by someone like Keith Ellison uh, as Attorney General, uh, uh, that this will become an institutionalized practice and the investigation of Mr. Durham will simply go away. I understand your concern. Uh, one more thing. A term we keep hearing from the left is, oh, these are mostly peaceful protests, mostly peaceful. It seems to me that you either are or you're not. Uh, calling what's happening in our cities mostly peaceful pro uh, protests is a, is a lot like calling Scott Peterson a mostly faithful husband or uh, Al Capone a mostly law-abiding businessman. Um, there is a constitutional right to peaceably assemble. Where does that right stop? when it becomes violence, criminal activity. You know, and that's the challenge here. I mean, uh, you have a lot of people who are out protesting and demonstrating, and that's uh, important First Amendment activity that we believe strongly in and try to protect. Um, and uh, the particular violent opportunists that are involved here get into those crowds and then start engaging in very violent activity and, and hijack it. And a lot of protesters have been telling law enforcement and providing information to us about these people who are not with them, they're not demonstrators, but they're coming in. And a lot of the demonstrators leave when that happens because they see what's happening themselves. Would you call that violence a myth? Gentleman's time. No. The gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Liu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barr, for being here today. I'd like to ask you some questions about the legal standard for seizing and arresting protesters. Uh, under the Fourth Amendment, it requires probable cause before you can seize and arrest a protester, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. And the probable cause has to be particularized to a particular person. So if a protester was merely standing around in a crowd in the vicinity of someone else suspected of criminal activity, you cannot arrest that peaceful protester. In other words, there's no such thing as probable cause by mere association, correct? Well, not strictly, but I, I'll, I'll say that, you know, you do need particularized probable cause. Okay, and if there's no probable cause, if then someone jumps into a, a getaway car correct? and there are three or four people in there, that might be enough to give you probable cause, just those circumstances. You, you don't need it on each individual. Re reclaiming my time, Mr. Attorney General. If there is no probable cause, you can't arrest a protester, correct? I said at the beginning, arrest has to be predicated on probable cause. All right. Now, an arrest can also occur whether or not the federal official says it's an arrest. So, for example, if a federal officer takes a protester into custody, transport that protester, let's say, to a federal building, detains a person for questioning, that will constitute an arrest whether or not the federal official says the person is under arrest, correct? Well, that would require a very intensive in, uh, review of all the specifics involved. Uh, actually, it wouldn't. Uh, in the case of Dunaway versus New York, which is black letter law for over 40 years, the question was whether the police violated the Fourth and Fifteenth Amendments when, without probable cause to arrest, they took petitioners into custody, transported him to a police station, and detained him for questioning. So the answer is yes, that would constitute an no, arrest. No, the answer is that, you know, Fourth Amendment is ultimately governed by reasonableness, and it, there can be circumstances. The, the question sometimes is when does something actually become custody? Reclaiming my time, I'm cite this is not a trick question. Mr. Barr, I'm just citing you what the Supreme Court said. So here's a problem. Under this standard black letter law, which has been in effect for over 40 years, what the federal forces in Portland did was unconstitutional. Federal forces in full combat gear, in the dark of night, grabbed a protester who was peacefully standing there, forced him into an unmarked van, drove him to a separate location, searched him, 
detained him and questioned him. That is what police states do. That's what authoritarian yeah, regimes do. But I don't do. think those were the facts. That's not, I haven't asked you a question yet, Mr. Barr. Okay. What the federal, federal officials did was illegal because they didn't have probable cause. And how do we know that? Because Deputy Director of the Federal Protective Service, Chris Klein, admitted it on national TV. Deputy Director Klein said that the individual that they were questioning was in a crowd and in an area where another individual was aiming a laser at the eyes of officers. That's guilt by association. That's what the Fourth Amendment prohibits. Deputy Director Klein further stated that the protester was released after federal officials concluded, quote, they did not have what they needed, unquote, which again shows there's no probable cause. And it appears that federal uh, Deputy Director Klein appears to understand that there was no probable cause because he essentially justifies that action as saying it wasn't an arrest. He calls it, quote, a simple engagement, unquote. I'm a former prosecutor. I've never heard that term, a simple engagement, because it's a made up excuse. What these federal officials did was an arrest. They grabbed a peaceful protester, they forced him into a van, drove him to another location, questioned him. That is exactly what the Supreme Court prohibited over 40 years ago. So I obviously, incident. I obviously don't know that. Washington Post, I'm, I haven't asked you a question yet. In a Washington Post article on July 24th entitled Operation Diligent Valor, federal agents told reporters that there's no basis for these arrests. They said, quote, at times they have grabbed an individual and taken them inside the courthouse for questioning before determining that they had no probable cause to charge them with any crime, unquote. W. Director Klein said that they um, coordinate with the U.S. Attorney's Office on all of these arrests. I urge you to instruct your federal officials to comply with the Constitution, and I ask you to investigate these arrests because many of them are in violation of the Fourth Amendment. We do not live in a police state. We are better than that. I yield back. Gentleman well, yields back, Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, since Representative Liu didn't allow you any time to answer his allegations, would you care to answer any of his allegations? Yes. I mean, obviously, I, I don't know all the particulars of any individual case out there, but uh, based on my general understanding, uh, what had happened uh, was that when they tried to effectuate arrests of the ringleaders or the people who were engaged in violence or that they saw with lasers and so forth, and they went out. They were immediately swarmed by people in black, and there was a lot of violence, so they couldn't effectuate the rest. So the modus operandi was changed, and based on uh, specific information as to individuals who were seen doing things and identified, they later tried to pick them up uh, when there was less of a risk of this kind of mob response. The fact that you, if you have information uh, that someone has a laser and is using it and later pick him up and he doesn't have it, it doesn't mean that there wasn't probable cause. It means he doesn't have the laser. The question is, you know, was it reasonable for you to rely on the information that you had and the identification of that individual? In some cases, it could be a misidentification. In other cases, it could be the person, you know, ditched the laser. So there is a distinction between whether the person ultimately can be shown to have violated the law and whether there was probable cause for the police to make the inquiry and, and, and take them and, and interrogate them or ask them questions at least. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. You know, I think, um, I have to tell you, you probably know this, my constituents are scared. Americans are scared. I mean, they watch the TV, they see all this rioting, looting going on, statues being torn down. Uh, in Arizona, uh, where I'm from, more guns are being sold than ever. I think there's more new gun owners uh, than ever. And uh, this has to stop. And I think that it's really important, as the saying goes, that in order to solve a problem, the first step is to realize there's a problem. And so it always, I find it very disturbing, should I say, that Chairman Nadler de denies that Antifa even exists. He said it to a reporter. Um, he said on the floor of the Uni United States House of Representatives that it was a fantasy, a made up fantasy. Uh, and then in this very room just recently, Congresswoman Jayapal, who represents the Seattle area said, when I was talking about the autonomous zone, 
and the takeover. Um, she said, the area is just a few miles from where I sit right now, and there is no takeover. There is no takeover. Uh, she also said, lies are being spread by my colleagues in this committee. This area is perfectly peaceful. Um, she also said, my Republican colleagues keep saying the Seattle police precinct was taken over by protesters. This is incorrect, incorrect. No one has taken over that building. Um, Mr. Attorney General, is that your understanding of what happened there? Do, do you agree with Ms. Jayapal that there was no takeover? It was just Jayapal. Peaceful? If you're going to say my Jayapal. name, please say it right. It's Jayapal. Jayapal, do you, would you agree with that? And also, in answer, why do you think these autonomous zones in Democrat-led cities are dangerous to America? Well, starting with the, uh, they're dangerous because uh, they are purporting to keep on the outside uh, duly constituted authority of the government. They're also, to me, uh, outrageous because these pe the people who are living now under this autonomous zone haven't selected the government. They've selected the duly authorized government of the city and the state. So it's quite an outrage that, that people would, would take, use force to take over an area. What, what makes me concerned for the country is this is the first time in my memory that the leaders of one of our great two political parties, uh, the Democratic Party, are not coming out and condemning mob violence and the attack on federal courts. Uh, why can't we just say, you know, the, the violence against federal courts has to stop? Could we hear something like that? Mr. Attorney General, I totally agree. I support what you're doing, and I support what President Trump is doing for law and order in our country, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The committee will stand in recess for five minutes.